Good evening and welcome to what's quite a hot and sticky evening at Policy Exchange. Thank you for braving the uh, remarkable weather with us uh, to come and uh, speak and hear us speak about uh, planning for infrastructure and growth and uh, how to ensure London's uh, place in the global economy. So I'm Matthew Oakley, I head up Policy, Ex Policy Exchange's work on uh, economics and social policy. Um, that's a pretty broad remit, everything from the macroeconomy and growth all the way through to um, the more social side of things around the labour market um, and you know, even for the care system. Kind of somewhere in the middle of all that is, are the, I guess, the infrastructure and uh, things we all use and, and use on a day-to-day -day basis but, and, but take for granted. Um, so, you know, really pleased today to have a, such a, you know, a fine, fine cast of speakers to, to talk about these, these huge issues. Um, also, really, really pleased to see that Justine Greening has very helpfully teed up today's debate on the front page of the Evening Standard. Um, minister in shock warning on more runways, um, basically arguing about the need to take a, a longer-term vision on infrastructure and planning for infrastructure. And hopefully those, that's one of the key things that uh, will come up today, is this need to actually think of a lot longer term about what the needs of um, London in particular, and more generally, the UK economy. Uh, the UK economy. Um, so it's pretty clear that infrastructure is pretty important, and it's an advantage to what uh, we do here at Policy Exchange in terms of the growth agenda. That's both in the, the long term in terms of trying to really drive uh, productivity and, and UK growth, but also quite an interesting take on the shorter term, so thinking about a lot of the uh, debates across Whitehall at the moment around how to, how to really boost growth in, in, in the short term, whether we should be borrowing more now to try and uh, put money into infrastructure and infrastructure investment. And nowhere is that kind of more true, I guess, than in, than in London, where you know, if we're going to continue to really attract the best people and the best companies and business to, to London, our capital, we're going to really need to keep uh, striving to, to put more infrastructure in place, to make what we have work better. Um, and I think where we've probably seen a bit of a decline in the, in the last few years is in kind of the ranking of infrastructure in, in the UK economy and perhaps in London more generally. And so what can we do to try and turn, turn that around and actually really improve the, the situation? Kind of what, one of the things Policy Exchange talks a lot about is the role of planning and all this. Um, reports we've published um, recently, Cities for Growth, argues that the planning system has, has been a huge failure for particularly the, the, housing, uh, the housing market. But that can be drawn more generally across to infrastructure, to all parts of development, where potentially as a result of a, a, a small but vocal minority of people, um, we're really, really limiting the amount of uh, development we can really put through uh, because they, they don't feel like they should be uh, taking these things into the local area, where actually it can be a huge benefit to the, to the wider economy. And, and the UK more generally. So that's the kind of theme of today, is how, you know, what kind of infrastructure can we need for the future? How can we plan for that, those infrastructure needs? And how can we make sure that everyone's bought into that process? How can we make sure that local people are bought in and actually, you know, we move from having this, this, grand, this grand idea about what infrastructure we, we, we might have to actually being able to, to deliver that on the ground? I'm not the expert here. I'm going to um, leave it there and hand over to our, our fine selection of panellists. Uh, we have Lord Sassou, uh, the Commercial Secretary of the Treasury, who I'll ask to speak first, followed by Mike Gerrard, um, Managing Director of Thames Tunnel, uh, Professor Paul Cheshire, um, Professor of Economic Geography at the London School of Economics, and finally uh, Neil Bennett, partner of Farrell and Partners, um, with, with a, a focus on uh, strategic infrastructure and urban design projects. Um, without further ado, I'll ask each speaker to speak for five or ten minutes and then open up to a Q&A. So, uh, uh, thanks very much, um, Matthew. And I, I'm going to um, definitely plead also to be another non-expert in this um, this gathering, and hope to um, listen and learn as much as um, pontificate but, from from up here. But let, let me just say one or two things to um, frame the debate. And, and um, I wasn't going to talk about government fiscal policy, but just to well, uh, reassure you that um, notwithstanding interest rates on the 10-year gilts at 1.7% um, or wherever they are tonight, um, tempting though it is to go on a sort of classic um, Keynesian um, spending or investing splurge, um, we're not going to risk it. But I 
do believe that based on all the discussions I have with um, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, others around the world, that um, the one thing we're not going to be short of uh, is capital if we can come um, forward um, with uh, good, worthwhile projects in London or, or elsewhere, of course, around uh, the country. Um, we will, as we did last year, where there are um, savings to be had, try and recycle them into worthwhile capital projects, um, both because of the economic, the marginal economic payback that we can get, but also the um, uh, the benefit of the short-term growth stimulus. So we're certainly looking for opportunities um, at the margin, but the really big projects, we've got to make sure um, that they are privately financeable, that we um, continue to have the reputation we presently have around the world as um, the best regulated market um, for long-term infrastructure mm -hmm. spend. But that's enough about that bit of um, broad background. Um, what, what does it look like in London? I mean, we've got this, this picture that we all suffer um, terrible congestion. Most of us do um, uh, on a daily basis. We have these great debates. We'll then uh, discuss it this evening about rail and air connections. And yet, London continues to be rated as the um, number one global city in which to do business, particularly financial services business. And this is all a bit sort of paradoxical um, in a way. Um, and, and if you go back, think about just the last 20 years, what has been done without all the sort of classic planning and all the actual planning difficulties there are, a London without the London City Airport, a London without the, um, the CTRL link into St Pancras, London, uh, where Canary Wharf was just only starting up in London without the new Wembley or Emirates Stadium. I think um, uh, Farron Partners in Bankman Place, which less than 20 years ago was kind of one of the iconic new office blocks of London that stood out there above Charing Cross and now, I don't say it looks ordinary, it's still a very fine building, but, but you know, now there are um, masses and masses of um, um, similarly important office blocks. So we, we've come a long way in the last um, 20 years and I don't think we should forget it, but nevertheless there is a huge amount more to do. Um, this is a government that is very committed to getting it right. No other government in this country um, has been bold enough to put forward um, the start of a vision um, for a national infrastructure and the National Infrastructure Plan, which we've been through um, two iterations of. No government since, um, well, in the last 50, 60 years has done anything remotely as radical um, to the planning framework as we've done with the National uh, Planning Policy Framework. Um, against the background of a very difficult um, fiscal position, one of our first um, decisions was, of course, to confirm uh, that Crossrail um, should go ahead 14 and a half billion pounds of, of public and private money. Um, we now have a cabinet committee um, chaired by Danny Alexander, on which I sit, where we regularly look at the 40 top national priority projects and um, the ministers responsible um, have to account for the progress um, on them. So uh, I would argue that infrastructure has never been um, as close to the heart uh, of the government as it is um, now. But there is, um, there is a lot to do I and mean, I, I really do want to hear people's views on where we've got to with the planning reforms. I mean, as, as my boss George Osborne um, put it, I think in the, the last budget, what did he say? Um, you can't earn your future if you can't get your planning permission. Um, and yes, we've done the, um, uh, the planning is, is out and in operation, but there's lots more to be done to reduce the information requirements, to, to amend the use class order regime from April next year, um, to give the detail on the 12-month planning guarantee and so on. So um, we, we, there's lots to talk about there. I should be particularly interested to hear what um, Mike has to say about um, the Thames Tideway Tunnel, where that, that's a current uh, very good test case where we see lots of people in, in, in different parts of London 
um, not wanting the, uh, the digging to be um, anywhere uh, on their patch, where we have a Secretary of State um, in communities and local government who has, I think, been um, doing um, all the right things by issuing safeguarding directions to, uh, to, to, to make sure that um, we do make as much progress with the planning as possible, but Mike, Mike will, will tell us um, uh, uh, more about that. Just on some of the challenges that are ahead, um, and some of the priorities, um, I mean, I know from just talking him, to him before that, that Paul is probably going to have some challenging um, words to say about um, HS2. All I would say is we do need to be bold. We are not like the French. Um, uh, we, we Grand Projet do not come naturally. I mean, if you look at what Baron Postman did to Paris in the 19th century compared to what John Nash was able to do nearly creating Regent's Park and Regent Street. <laughs> We have a long record about uh, 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 in this area, but nevertheless, we are going to be as bold as we can be. HS2 and eventually creating a Y-shaped high-speed um, rail network linking London, the Midlands, Yorkshire, <coughs> Scotland um, is a high priority. Um, I, I, as, as a Treasury Minister, you know, I have to say the M25 would never have got built if the Treasury had been allowed to um, uh, get its way. The economic modelling which the Treasury, uh, the Treasury did, not far distant from the, 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 the economic models, the models have improved a bit, but the, 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 the M25 um, did not meet um, the criteria um, and uh, there will always be projects on which um, we need to be bold. Airports, um, Matthew's already referred to the fact that the debate is, uh, you know, is live, which it, it, it um, uh, needs to be, and we will be getting out a consultation document um, in the reasonably near future to um, invite um, all ideas. Um, there are one or two things that are, that are close to my heart, which we need to keep um, the, uh, the pressure on. Um, and I'm delighted to see that at last the batting in sight, I mean, I don't know how many hands it will have gone through, but it looks like the latest competition um, is coming to a conclusion. The government will work very hard to make sure that we, uh, um, we get the arrangements in for the Northern Line extension, which is key to unlocking uh, that site. Um, one of my bugbears is why on earth we, um, we have a capital city unlike any other major financial centre where you can't use your mobile phone um, on the tube. How can we expect people to be taking the tubes and getting off the roads if you can't even use your mobile phone? Um, so it's, it's very good that there, there are going to be Wi-Fi experiments <coughs> and a lot of tube stations um, um, imminently through the, uh, the Olympics and that will be the start of that. Um, I think the greatest opportunity, and it's an extraordinary one um, for those of you who don't know the East End of London, um, that we have in the borough of Newham alone, so between the Olympic site and the river, we have developable land which is roughly um, a third of the entire acreage of Manhattan. Um, which is ripe for development. And there are already extraordinary things um, going on down there, um, whether it's um, uh, IKEA Foundation, never, never having done property development in the UK, putting 1,500 homes just outside the Olympic Park, or it's down in the Royal Docks where um, the council are already branding it um, Tech City Plus with a cluster of um, a cluster of um, tech businesses going down there. So I, I think there is enormous opportunity out there. I really want to hear this evening what it is that you think government um, should be focusing on to unlock these opportunities. We are up for it, um, but I recognise there is a huge amount still uh, to be done. things I want to talk about uh, tonight. I mean, the planning you're asking another thing, Jason. I'm sure that will come up in the, the Q&A session. The two things for me, uh, talking about infrastructure projects, are value for money and long-termism. I want to talk about each of those in turn. Now, it's 
absolutely clear, you will hear it I'm sure from Paul shortly, uh, the relationship between uh, infrastructure investment and a whole series of benefits that flow on the back of that. And I can tell you, as uh, heading up one of the largest uh, projects uh, in the country at the moment, I'm very mindful of all these different aspects of the benefit that a project like ours creates. So when you spend the money on a large infrastructure project, absolutely it's about delivering that particular project and the benefits associated with that project, you know, on time, on budget. And then the second point you look at is this. We're not the only project. If you consider a project as an island, you completely miss the next phase of the story, which is if you think of your project as part of a, a connected series of projects which are a program, which will be coming to market after about the same time, there are things you can do if you behave like a program that you can't do if you're considering your project in isolation. So ours, our project, for example, work very closely with Crossrail, and I have to say Infrastructure UK is instrumental in a lot of this, in, in making sure that we um, access you know, economies of scale or productivity gains, things like that, where we are frankly joined up. So that we have, for example, working with Crossrail, there's a thing called the Tunneling and Underground Construction Academy, uh, training apprentices to come onto uh, the Crossrail scheme, and we will also benefit from that. So joint action between projects is your second level of value for money. The first level of value for money is the project itself, the second level of value for money is what you can achieve by being connected to other projects as part of a program. You've heard the National Infrastructure Plan. There are 40 priority projects in that. We're one of them. And yes, through the help of Infrastructure UK, we talk to the others and try and access those additional efficiencies. Then the third level of benefit, obviously, that comes from a project are the jobs we create. Now, a project like Thames Tunnel is 4,000 direct jobs and 5,000 indirect jobs for the metrics for us. Very important. And then the fourth level of, of benefit is really to the wider economy. And the umpteen reports have been done about the policy exchange we heard from Matthew, London first, and in fact, Infrastructure UK through the National Infrastructure Plan talks about those wider economic benefits of investment. Now, for me, it's not just about creating jobs on the back of the project, but it's creating sustainable jobs and the way in which businesses can grow on the back of these large ticket investments. But I have to say on this, and here's sort of, you know, the first sort of controversial remark for me for the evening. There are some salutary tales. I used to do quite a bit of work with the government of Scotland, and I heard this uh, statistic from, from them some years ago. On the back of North Sea oil and gas, uh, some tens of billions of pounds have flowed, flowed through the Scottish economy. And the question is, how many domestic Scottish companies have grown on the back of that investment programme to become world leaders in their own field? Depressingly few, very few. More recently, uh, the PFI and PPP programme has pushed something like 60 billion of, of capital investment through the UK economy. And the equivalent question is how many British firms have taken that opportunity, grown on the back of it, to become world leaders in their own field? Again, depressingly few. And I think some of you might be able to think of a number of uh, overseas companies that have perhaps done slightly better on the back of the UK program than we have done ourselves. So there's an issue there in terms of how we are making sure that in times of austerity, every pound we invest in these projects has to work again and again and again. And I'm talking about four different ways in which each pound is spent. And one of those ways has to be in terms of helping businesses not just create the jobs that are associated with the project itself, but as a business, somehow learning and growing on the back of that. So you can do things afterwards that you couldn't do beforehand. You become a, a, a growth story for the, for the economy. One of the metrics that I think is a pretty reliable statistic is that for each pound invested in construction in this country, you get a, a GDP effect of about three pounds. But again, Paul may, may challenge me on that one, but that's a figure I've heard that's quite reliable. The second topic then for me is long-termism. And I was um, very pleased to be present at a speech that Prime Minister gave back in March at the Institute of Civil, where he talked about a horizon shift. And I think that's absolutely where we need to be. It was a really impressive speech. Now, I used to work in the city, and I, like some of you I recognize in the room who work in the city, will have heard the adage more than once that a long-term investment is a short-term investment that's gone wrong. Um, and that, you know, I'm afraid that sort of pervasive assumption it's still out there. Now, I'm not saying that all that sort of short-termism sits in the city. Uh, having spent uh, many years working in or around the public sector, I can testify to the fact that short-termism and false economies are just as alive in the public sector as they are in the private sector. 
one of the things I look at when I head up a project like Tennis Tunnel, for me it's about intergenerational legacy. I mean, that's something in fact that James you really touched on there earlier. For me, and I suppose, um, you know, certainly for the Victorians who are putting in place the sewer network we are all still relying on, there was something like intergenerational legacy it was almost like a moral obligation. It wasn't something they hesitated at. And Sir Joseph Bazalgette, when he was mapping out the sewer network we've now got, um, he had a population in London of 1 million. He built a system that was designed for 4 million. Today we have 8 million people uh, relying on that network, and guess what? It's full to capacity. And so we have a situation in which uh, every week, in fact, we have overflow events of rural sewage into the River Thames. It's absolutely disgusting. Something has to be done. Many other cities around the world which have the same legacy of infrastructure of our antiquity for like 150 years have sort of got on and done their equivalent of the Thames Tunnel. We are afraid of being a little bit late in coming to it, but we're getting there eventually. Now again, one of the questions I ask myself is why do we find it quite hard to say yes to these large, long-term intergenerational projects? Because we clearly do. There's a systemic, systemic sort of pattern that we are not uh, the leaders that we once were, we now tend to sort of follow. And again, my second sort of controversial remark for the evening on this is I do think there's something around the investment method, the appraisal methodology we use, because those of you familiar with the Green Book and other manuals like that, the, the way the methodology works is fundamentally has two aspects. A, that the correct shoes to be standing in when you're uh, evaluating a project and investment opportunity are today's shoes, that's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that the future, the further into the future that a benefit arises from your project, the less value it has to society. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to work out that if you're standing in the shoes of today and the, and the further into the future a benefit arises, the less value it has to society, you will have a short-term strategy. And the only way you're going to overcome that is to deem something like intergenerational legacy as a social good in its own right, that in a sense trumps discounted cash flow in some way, or has some relevance in the way you're um, evaluating a project. If you are genuinely going to be committed to a long-term strategy, you've got to do something like that to change the way you evaluate projects. So you know, I'm hugely grateful for the help we've been getting from uh, James's team, Infrastructure UK and Treasury. I think in the National Infrastructure Plan, we are absolutely on track, we have the right strategy and framework. Uh, I think now the next challenge is sort of embedding that sort of long-term thinking. From value for money point of view, it's about making every single pound that I'm responsible for investing work in the four different ways I've been describing. And I said, above all, I really do want to see if on the back of projects like the Thames Tunnel, we can get a, a social benefit like intergenerational legacy just locked into our whole way of thinking about these projects so we don't sort of agonize over them for <coughs> years and years rather than sort of getting on with them. So those are the thoughts I want to share. There will be time, I'm sure, to talk about planning, because I know that's another issue that's of, of interest to many of you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so this is about infrastructure and planning. I'm not going to say great about planning, but I'm very happy to answer questions about it, uh, since it's something I've been looking at the economic consequences of for about 30 years now. Um, and the first point is that infrastructure doesn't generate growth. I mean, it does in the sort of narrow sense that, that if there are jobs involved and some of the wider effects that we just hear about, so there. But it isn't transformation. You know, as the people of Birmingham will discover when high speed two comes online, it'll suck activity to London. What infrastructure does, and it's vital, is that it facilitates and it enables. Its role is really important. You can't have a functioning economic system without infrastructure to support it. And the problem is that markets don't signal very well where and what infrastructure is needed. Um, it does require an intelligent public sector and intelligent planning and strategic thinking to identify what infrastructure is needed to make a particular city's economy or national economy work more effectively. But there are some sort of price type signals that we can, can use and should use. Uh, you know, the prices of slots at Heathrow Airport tell us a lot about 
shortage of capacity at Heathrow. There's a real productive demand for sorts at Heathrow. <coughs> and as uh, the Edmonton report, sadly, I think, forgotten, because it was a pretty rational attempt to think about transport infrastructure investment four years ago, as it, as the Eddington report argued, congestion. Congestion is a sort of pricing. Uh, it's telling you where people want to travel. Uh, it's not really sort of really very difficult to work out that what you should be doing with transport infrastructure is putting it where people want to travel where it's short supply relative to demand. And Eddington, if you look at it, had a lovely map of congestion in terms of lost time per kilometre of link across the United Kingdom. And if you look at that, it's overwhelmingly concentrated in the sort of widely defined London region. You take London sort of circled by Oxford, Cambridge, South, uh, South End, Reading, and, uh, and it's a bit more, actually Guildford, really. Uh, that's where about 75% of all the congestion in the UK is concentrated. There's some in Birmingham, there's some in Manchester, there's some in Leeds and Newcastle, uh, some in Glasgow. But it's really small potatoes relative to London and the region. Um, so what you need is where is congestion, where are costs rising, where is the system itself becoming less reliable? Because lack of reliability itself is a significant cost. And all those signals point to the widely defined London region as where investment in both commuting rail and in roads is really seriously needed for the British economy. Uh, move on to, uh, to airports uh, and their role. Um, now, I'm actually... Uh, been convinced, particularly in the last five years, that climate change is a serious, a really serious threat that we need to take very seriously. Uh, it's a, but I think it's really woolly minded to think that you can seriously tackle climate uh, change by restraining demand for airports uh, in the place where they are most productive. What you need is policies that tackle the, uh, the technology of transport, so energy emissions go down. I mean, California is a wonderful example of what regulation can achieve uh, in terms of, say, small production and emissions reduction. Uh, and you need pricing, you need to price <coughs> emissions. And you do need, I'm, I'm supportive of the attempts by the European Union to do that in the face of some opposition. But you don't want to ration capacity where it is most productive, and that is clearly Heathrow. Um, we need to expand Heathrow's capacity. Why? Because London is, London region is the powerhouse of the UK economy. A hub airport is absolutely critical to the functioning of that uh, economy. Uh, the advocates of Boris Island uh, claim that he throws in the wrong place. They sometimes add the rider if we were starting from scratch. Mm. We are not starting from scratch. That is the whole point of the argument. And uh, we've got a major existing airport, which is serviced by the service infrastructure to get to it. But that's not the major cost of uprooting it and having it working inefficiently. Uh, no, there's, a tr there's a treasury cost, which the treasury is always very conscious of, but actually there's a huge potential private sector cost. The whole London economy, which is a huge economy, is geared to location. Location is vital. The companies that are close to Heathrow are not there by chance. They're there because Heathrow is vital to their business. If Heathrow ceases to be a major uh, functioning hub, then they will simply become uncompetitive. They will have to move or simply go out of business. But it's not just even the companies, and that's a real resource cost in economic terms, it's all their labour forces as well. And their labour forces are in that area, their labour catchment areas. And it's all geared to 60 years of Heathrow being the most important airport in Britain, and previously, no longer, the most important airport in Europe. 
It isn't only about those sorts of real economic costs. It's also, I argue, about equity. I think that the problem with development, and one of the reasons why you're having trouble, is that there really are actual costs of development to local residents and to people who live in the area. And we're very bad at recognising that properly and compensating people properly. We should be much more uh, in, in the private sector, which the now private sector, I've often argued this and I'm told that, oh, you can't have people bribing people to agree. Yeah, why not? Why not compensate them for the costs they're suffering? And then, no whole nimbyism will largely erode. Uh, but it isn't just that. The point is, I've also done a lot of research on housing markets and how they work. And what academic research demonstrates almost beyond doubt is that housing markets are incredibly good at reflecting the local costs and benefits of particular locations. Airport noise is reflected in house prices, fully reflected in house prices. Not just current airport noise, but expected future levels of airport noise. People don't look out of their bedroom uh, windows in Richmond and say, oh, there's airplanes above us. They've been there, they know they're there, and they've been compensated through the housing market. If you suddenly uproot Heathrow and put it in Boris Island, that would be truly uh, unfair, because it would suddenly dump on people who quite reasonably haven't expected that they're going to be troubled by aircraft noise and pollution, a whole new nasty environmental fact, which will also substantially reduce the price of the value of their houses. <laughs> Whereas the people who live in are affected by Heathrow, they've, they've, been bene they've benefited from the noise by getting cheap houses, and some of them, of course, actually use Heathrow quite a lot, and it's uh, useful to them. Uh, so, we do not start from scratch, and this is something that applies more widely. Lots of urban infrastructure has nasty effects on people who live locally, and the, and, the, and the logic of that is that you put it where it already is. When you need to expand capacity so far as possible, you do it where it is, incinerators, sewage farms, etc. Because it's already factored into people's behaviour, into their expectations, and into the price they pay for their housing. So, you know, Britain is woefully bad at making decisions, and I think it has something to do uh, with our refusal to compensate people who actually uh, experience the, the, the negatives. And that's, uh, you know, reflected. If you look at passenger traffic going through London's international airports, uh, how that's grown since 1991 compared to Schiphol in Amsterdam and Charles de Gaulle in, in, in Paris. You know, London and Gatwick together from 100 to 160, uh, Charles de Gaulle from 100 to 260, Schiphol from 100 to 270. You know, London's airport system is falling behind and it's falling behind quite rapidly and potentially dangerously. So just a final little topic, which we possibly don't think of as part of infrastructure, but I would claim as part of London's important infrastructure, which is housing. Uh, housing is in critical short supply in London, and it's not just housing somewhere where people don't want to live of the type that they don't want to buy, it's particularly housing which actually is where the jobs are. If you look at a map of local authorities across the wider southeast and you look at job growth and housing growth, it's almost perfectly inversely correlated. <laughs> they put houses where there aren't jobs and we've been systematically doing that since about 1975. Uh, and it can't be resolved just within the boundaries of the Greater London Authority. Uh, if you look at maps of where London's daily commuters come from, they're now, the, the more skilled they are, the further they travel. They're now travelling in significant numbers from Oxford, Cambridge, yeah, we know that, from Reading, we know that, but from the New Forest, from Norwich, from Peterborough, from, uh, from 180 kilometres away, there are significant numbers of people making daily journeys to London because they've had to jump the green belt which is a, 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 a necklace, a, a, a noose around London's uh, expansion. And now I think that, you know, the government were brave with their draft national planning framework. You know, it was a good try, but I fear it was yeah. boulderized and emasculated in the, in, in the delivery ultimately. <laughs> uh, and it ain't, and you know, that, we've got incentives, that's another good idea. 
but they're not enough. We, have a, we don't have just a problem, we have a crisis. What we need is the fire of London equivalent. You probably don't know. In 1580, there was a Tudor green belt imposed on the city of London. No new houses could be built within three miles of the walls of the city of London. That was then extended to seven miles. They were being knocked down. For the same ultimate reasons, protecting the interests of, of, of people who were in the city. That went on until the fire of London, when the system fell apart. Thank God. What we need is another fire of London to sort of burn up our existing insane uh, policies on planning. Yeah. Um, and that's urgent, uh, and it's a, it, it's a real millstone for London because it's increasing the costs of operating in London. I'm, I'm, I'm not a humble academic, I'm an extremely arrogant academic who's well paid. <laughs> uh, I've actually, I calculated it quite recently, made more, quite really good on paper, made more from my investments in housing over, actually over the last 15, 20 years than I have in all my salary, over all my academic life, and I'm very old. This is an insane distortion of how incentives should be structured. We need to pay people for doing productive work, not for sitting on real estate in the right place. And so I think that's part of it. And it's also, of course, grossly unfair, because it's a, a transfer of real resources to old parts like me, away from young people and people who really London's economy needs in its labour force. Thank you for the, for the throwaway large part of my speech there. Yeah. Um, what, what I will do is talk about the P word, planning, probably with a, a small P. Um, maybe also I should mention I'm a practitioner, so I will be talking about practical things. Two things then. Um, one is. is um, I was, going to, I was going to say the power of infrastructure to drive the economic activity, but perhaps I won't be able to say that now. But the second one is really about planning and how you plan the infrastructure. Um, there, there are two extremes. There's having what we call the picture on, on, on the box. There's also the elements that give you that big picture on the jigsaw or on the box. And then there's the balance between the two of them. You probably can't have both of those things at the same time. Um, we at Farrells, we build a lot of this stuff, the infrastructure stuff. We've not built much in this country because we don't build much of this in this country. In China, we built the equivalent of London's railway termini uh, in about eight years in two high speed uh, rail stations. So you can do it quite quickly uh, at Bell Square. We've also recently done a visual piece of work for London Borough Panthers and Fulham on the Old Oak Common. Now, I'll use our old oak column, which I can guarantee half of this room doesn't know where it is, to illustrate our thoughts about um, uh, in particular transport infrastructure and also uh, a different approach to linking uh, 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 airports. But if you go to the past first, um, London's uh, classic railway stations came into the uh, outskirts of the current um, commercial area um, in the mid-19th century. And there was a big problem there because you couldn't get from Houston to Victoria. And, and, and so on. And what happened then was uh, not a big plan, but actually a series of small scale um, individual interventions by people with money in their pockets who thought they were making a short term investment, probably a long term one. And what happened in bits, they built the circle line. They didn't plan it, they built it in, in, in bits. And I, I, what I would uh, uh, call for tonight is thought about how we can incrementally build the power infrastructure, how we can network it, and how we can layer it. And I'm really pleased to see that even now we've got uh, 10 to 2,000 being completed shortly. <laughs> and also we've got Crossrail coming in, both enriching the um, immensely enriching the, uh, our, our city here. So and moving on to getting the most out of it, infrastructure and going talking about all, all the common. Um, We've got a number of people who plan transport in, in the country. They're uh, not always joined up, and they're, they're planning things. There's some of them in, the, in this room tonight. And if you take them one by one, any one of them or any combination of them will transform connectivity there at, at Old Oak Common um, and make a very unusual place. Um, and what we've got happening is a crossrail station, possibly HS2, um, where uh, the nation needs a third of the uh, people off those trains to can get off and go somewhere else. Um, TfL talking about joining up London's under, uh, overground, the West London Line, North London Line, and we've got the, uh, the West Coast commuter lines possibly coming in as a new branch to Crossrail. 
Now, the connectivity with or without HS2, and I was waiting for an HS2 um, uh, cost-benefit analysis uh, note from there. The connectivity with or without HS2 could be met as a whole lot of common. Internationally, uh, the, the airport, you've got relatively simple access to seven runways. Seven runways. That could be London's airport. Nationally, you've got great access to the rest of Britain, particularly if you build the HS2. But at a London scale, uh, if you join up the North London Line or West London Line, you can get access to 90% of London's rail and tube stations by changing lines. If you think of the places that, that's got those attributes, that place is going to grow. Uh, it's also going to open an amount of underused land. Um, it's bigger than, than the Royal Box, so presumably that's a third of Manhattan or whatever the figure was. And uh, together with Buchanan's, the, uh, the economists, we, we've looked at all that common. We think there's an opportunity for London, uh, the, the, the nation, on the scale of, of, of the Canary Wharf the type of thing. And we think it probably will be a flow city, a bit like a Hong Kong um, you know, connected city. And with, with our HS2, we're, we're predicting that you could generate well over 100,000 jobs. Canary Wharf did that in 20 years. We would expect all that common to do that in 20 years. And they can generate 8.3 billion of gross value added. Um, now, arguably, you might be taking a large portion of that from elsewhere in London. If you get that degree of connectivity, you, you might want to go there anyway. And so it should, it, it could and should be uh, our biggest regeneration project. Uh, but we've got all kinds of problems. Uh, if we stay with transport planning for a minute, um, we've got Crossrail being built now. They've got, a, they've got a budget, they've got a program, and they don't want to hear about anybody who wants to change the thing there. We've got high speed 2 being planned to a very tight parliamentary schedule. Uh, we've got TfL trying to plan the Metropolitan in Interchange. My apologies to the Network Rail person here tonight. We've got the Network Rail coming up in, in the back, but, but, but they're coming up with a very good idea um, for plans for bringing in the uh, West Coast Main Line in, into all that common. Now, all those activities are happening in parallel. And they're very, very difficult to coordinate. I can tell you, I, I try to do this in, in, in my uh, uh, day job. The reason I'm going on about this is it's threatening to limit or even remove the possibilities of there being economic growth at all or at all. So how do we do it? Do we do it in parallel? Do we do it in sequence? Do we send some clever people away in a room for 10 years? I don't actually know the answer here. What is the big picture? But then the question is who does it? Um, does it public or private? Who does this planning? Um, and what, what, what is the role? Indeed, what is the ability to act of social government? Now, if that's transport, there's a further issue of land use planning. Um, the old oak common, the stuff going there, because it's currently a soft target in London, it's full of old train sheds, and that's why all, all the rail people have put things there. The land use planning is in another, another world, another, another parallel in the universe. And then there's the issue of whether they should be separately planned anyway. Um, in, in Hong Kong, we planned out the, uh, the new Kowloon station for metro and high speed rail link there. We also did a master plan for development of the station well, 20 years ago. And, and by now, they, they built uh, development of the station, it's about one and a half times of the Canary Wharf. My, but my key point is, is that they've been able to harness the economic value of that to support the rowing. High speed rail lanes don't make money on their own, they're not a, a viable thing. But if you can harness the uh, uplift from the real estate um, um, advantages that, 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 that they bring, You've both got economic growth in and around that hub, and you've got to support the railway. Finally, then, to move on to airports. I work at all the common latest book at all. Um, all the, the bigger picture about how you could connect um, uh, up the various assets that, that, that we've got. And my call tonight is for us to look at all of the options, not, not, not just the third runway or the Thames Estuary Airport. And whether we can, well, how we can best sweat and join up the existing and proposed transport infrastructure to um, these words again incrementally get to a network answer. Uh, we, we think in Britain, and these are glib figures I, I know, that, that today we've probably got 50 million passengers per year of unused capacity, we've probably got another 170 million passengers per year. Those of you who know about the, the Heathrow debate will see how large those that, that figures are. Could we into the new runways as we figure out what the demand for air travel might be? Could we link them up by better airside links? Could we join up better what, what we've got? You've seen some of the ideas around the press about a new railway through to Stansted. Should, could we use some of Stansted better? Could we do the circle line approach effectively, but just um, have a um, uh, incrementally provide answers to follow or, or anticipate demand and respond to the climate that we're in? 
this could be lowest cost, it could be uh, easiest to implement a screen, it could be the optimum, what I would um, stress, rather than the best performance level for, for this. So just to, to conclude, um, I do think that uh, infrastructure does drive uh, the accessibility and that does make a place country competitive and that does bring in economic growth. Uh, there are all the issues I've raised about how we should plan in parallel, about um, who should do it. Um, and then finally, looking within the bigger picture, there's, there's the need to incrementally uh, do this and look across all, all of our systems and bring them together and think about <coughs> aviation and road and where all, all, all was one system. And I think we'll find answers from that. straight to the floor and take potentially a couple of questions if you go. If you could just say who you are, uh, where you're from, and that she asked a question, that would be really great. There's a gentleman there and another one, and a gentleman that's there. Uh, Henry Barber from Gatwick Airport, actually, very pleased to hear of the lengthy discussion of various airport options on the table. Um, one brief comment and a question if I could. Um, I think firstly, from our perspective, the debate has to be about connectivity, not capacity. The fact is that we have 11, capacity for 11 million passengers at Gatwick, and we are getting links to emerging economies. China, South Korea, Vietnam, Hong Kong have all come through in the last four months. So the question really is, how do we actually enhance that capacity? How do we make the best of what we've got? And I very much agree with that, uh, with the comments made. Uh, and that, that, that builds into Eddington and how we realise Eddington's vision. And the question really is, how do we realise both Eddington's vision and the vision in the National Infrastructure Plan of better connecting our railways up to our airports? Um, there is a clear policy commitment in the National Infrastructure Plan to do that, yet we haven't actually seen any real meat on the bones from government on that yet. Uh, I would argue that one way of doing it would be through specific provision in the huge number of franchises that are currently up for renewal right now for better links, both in quality and extent, to airports. Very interested in the panel's views on, on that particular program. Okay, thanks. And the question just there. Uh, Simon Lucas, White House Consultancy. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for his uh, words about future of our capital flow uh, from sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. But within the context of uh, exponential growth of the public-private partnerships market internationally, how can we continue to ensure that the UK attracts that funding from the sovereign wealth funds and the pension funds internationally? Super James, perhaps you could put quick on you now. So, well, um, let, let me start on... Um, uh, well, first of all, this question of airport connectivity, and I know, I mean, I'm sure there are other fine airport operators um, in the room, but I mean, I think for those of us who go through Gatwick, it's tremendous to see what Gatwick has done to, to make its um, assets um, uh, more user-friendly, more passenger-friendly over the, the last few years. I mean, I know you have a very particular challenge with the Gatwick Express and upgrading the line, and you're putting a lot of the airport's money into Station. upgrading the station, so you're certainly doing what what you can, but I appreciate there's a lot lot more to be done. I mean, I think there was a reference to well, Thameslink, and we shouldn't forget, you know, a very important um, project of stitching together and improving what we've got from north to south across London, which of course comes your way um, very importantly. So I I don't think, um, you know, to take. Um, um, Neil's point about sort of stitching together. I think we've continued to stitch together over the last few years, um, uh, and we're rather, you know, perhaps rather good at it. Um, but can we do more? Well, again, I don't know whether it's stitching together or not. But um, I think in the autumn, Justine Greening will be coming out with a further um, refinement to the HS2 plans, including um, how the the link to Heathrow will be dealt with. So these things are in the in, in the thinking. Boris has talked about um, the, the improving the links to um, Stansted, so it's clearly uh, very much on his mind. Um, 
you know, perhaps afterwards you can tell me what, what other links you think we should be uh, should be working on. But if you if the, the point about uh, Gatwick Victoria and what needs to be done, um, I hear you um, loud and clear. On the sovereign wealth funds, um, I, I what, what, what I've been doing when I've been going particularly to the Middle Eastern funds is trying to get them to understand that um, they should compare UK infrastructure opportunities with investing in UK guilds rather than comparing UK infrastructure opportunities with, let's say, Indian or other high growth emerging market infrastructure opportunities. Because if what the sovereign <coughs> funds want um, is what appears to be high returns but with a lot of legal and regulatory risk around them, then you know we can't compete. But if what they what they want are steady, long-term cash um, uh, returns um, that are, you know, as has been seen um, over the last 20 years, pretty pretty safe in the environment here, um, and they're comparing I don't know a 10% return or something in, on infrastructure with a 2% return on long-term gilts, then or three percent for very long-term gilts, then you know that's what the sell is, and I find that that, that actually um, you know there's huge appetite for the Chinese and Tamils. Just take Thames Water, for example. The Chinese have uh, yeah, taken ten percent. The Abu Dhabians have uh, taken ten percent. I mean, I, I I would like to claim that it was because I went to Abu Dhabi and George Osborne went to, to Beijing just before the announcements of those investments. But they see the case, and we talk to you know we talk to all these people all the time about this. What really upsets me is that we. It, it, it's those funds and it's the Australian Canadian pension funds that are that are, that have been doing this very successfully, and that our own pension funds, um, with one or two honourable exceptions, have been um, very slow to come to the party. Because I would like to see all these gains. I mean, you know, as, as the minister partly responsible for all of this, uh, as I said, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of capital coming here. I just wish, as we are now building the platforms to help them. I just wish that our own pension funds and insurance companies had been um, quicker to the party. Before going over to the rest of the panel, I'd actually like to ask uh, my own question, and partly because I was interested in what Mike and Paul were saying and kind of the contrast. And you were talking, Mike was talking a bit about the, the long need for long termist kind of uh, attitude, and then Paul was saying that perhaps we can use uh, congestion as a, as a signal for where we need to build stuff, and that seems to kind of be at odds with each other because obviously long termism requires you know, planning for where the future demands are going to be, not where the current demands are. So perhaps by looking at where the congestion is now, perhaps you're actually being far too short termist. Then a more general question about how you actually do make that long term planning and you know, what what the best way for you know, working out what we need in the future is, let's say, say 40, 50, 60 years, you know, what was the Victorians did, you know, hundreds of years, or you know, and then working out how we do that. So any, my, any, any of those questions? Well, I think the, the signals obviously um, are varied. I think my point would be more around, I'm just not sure that our evaluation methodology that we use properly takes account of the long-term benefits to society. There's something missing. But how else can you explain the fact that there's sort of a systematic pattern in this, in this country, that we are sort of later than we should be in doing these things. We are, have agonized over projects like the Thames Tunnel for years after years. That is happening now. But other cities around the world have sort of gone on and done it. They go, why? We have to challenge ourselves in this. And then they, and that's, you know, congestion is not going to help my project. But it's you know, obviously relevant to transport. But you can think of other sectors. I want nobody's mentioned the, you know, the energy sector yet as well. But, you, know, you need a strategy. You absolutely need a strategy. You need a methodology that allows you to evaluate the projects and make those investment commitments in a way that addresses long term issues. Neil, any, any thoughts from the kind of practical point of view from people that actually do this? Well, maybe we should look at it um, from the bottom up, if I take that wrong for you, perhaps. Um, uh, maybe we should have said that. What about the passenger, passenger experience? Isn't is that part of paramount? I mean, um, I think you can almost gauge the attractiveness and almost use of the, the airport around London by the attractiveness of the environment. Um, and, and the whole route through the airport. Um, you know, should we have things like uh, seamless uh, ticketing? Um, I'd urge that you know, when we bring HS2 into the Heathrow, we don't impose another sort of railway type system on there. It's one that you can understand the mental map that you go to there to go to London, and that's it. There's only two choices. So, so there's all those things to do, because I think that, that it is commercially led in the end. Uh, airlines will want to go where they want to go in terms of the airport experience. 
I worry for Gatwick getting larger because there are congestion issues on the way into London. There needs to be some solutions there. I know there are some, some good intelligent fixes which are, which are being thought about there now. But the, um, and then finally, I, I just um, commend us all that we, we go further at the scale to, to think about the changes in the cross rail and tennis incorporating. Uh, I, I live in North East London. I, I realise that when Thames and Crossrail are, are open, I'll never go to anywhere else other than Farrington to go to an airport. I won't. <coughs> and I think we should just think about the, um, the implications of, of, of that. Paul? Oh. Um, <coughs> what do you mean? Is that that much difference but between us, actually? That uh, you know, you're talking sort of about like congestion, the overflow into the Thames of the North Sewage. That is, you know. It's a form of the suit system is congested. We need more capacity. Um, and I don't think that... I think that building a transformational infrastructure, because you're going to turn a regional economy around, but that region is essentially somewhere where people don't want to be, it hasn't got the human skills, and it hasn't got productive capacity, is, is, is insane. Um, particularly it's insane when you've got crying need of congestion in other parts of the country which are far more productive. And, you know, congestion costs <coughs> London's economy and therefore the UK's economy a lot of real resources in terms of lost time, in terms of failed meetings. I nearly didn't get here by the way because suddenly I discovered that uh, the mall is closed to even bicycles. <laughs> but, um, so I think you know, when we've dealt with congestion, then we can worry about planning wonderful systems for the future. But, but the future, is, you know, the, the old adage about cost-benefit analysis is that never if you did a cost-benefit analysis of draining Dutch polders would you have reached a viable rate of return so you wouldn't have followed. And I think that's a fair point. <coughs> but nevertheless, despite that, even if you were to take account of the long term and use a much lower discount you would still get a pretty high rank correlation in the ordering of projects. I'm sure the turnstile was needed. Crossrail was a bit marginal. High speed too is clearly a huge opportunity cost to things like upgrading the western uh, rail line or getting good rail access to Heathrow from the west, which we're not going to be doing, or getting more capacity sooner on the main trunks of the rail system, uh, which have Terrible bottlenecks in Thank you. And it isn't short term. Any more questions? There's a gentleman there, a lady just in the front, and then a gentleman just over there as well. This is a similar question to the microphone just behind you. Uh, Gordon is from London Partners, the uh, Boris's promotion and economic development company. Um, similar question about joining up, um, and uh, Neil mentioned joining up <coughs> at Old Oak Common. Um, we, when we're looking to bring in anchor tenants or investors, whether that's Croydon or um, the, the, do uh, the Royal uh, Docks at Newham, are dealing with eight, nine public bodies um, at national government level, at, at local borough level, um, at London level, and that's even before we start getting into planning or start to go talk to the financiers and developers. Um, what we've seen in the run-up to the Olympics is city governance, city ops, and relations with national government transformed uh, in the way that those organisations work because we have a deadline and we have to do it to it happen. What can we learn from that going forward so that that can become a new benchmark rather than reverting to the old way of working that takes 15 years to get these things done? Thanks. And the ladies in front. Silvia from the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've got a question on just two, with two points really about Heathrow and Tolldale Common. Uh, first of all, Heathrow, um, the government is talking about connecting HS2 to Heathrow, but we don't even know if Heathrow will be there in 30 years' time um, in, in relation to the aviation strategy. So, um, is there, uh, I mean, the, the London Chamber thinks that the government should commit to just having Heathrow there and just get on with it, but also the HS2 should go directly through Heathrow rather than Odo Common because um, as Paul said that the um, infrastructure should be put where there is demand and to be honest at Odo Common there isn't any demand there at the moment so isn't it better if HS2 went directly through Heathrow rather than Odo Common? Thanks and the final question just over there. 
Thanks very much. <coughs> Rod Dowler from the Industry Forum, and I also run a small bank of mum and dad on the side. Um, okay, what, what um, <laughs> I, I wonder if we've kind of, we've talked a lot about big projects. Um, I think we've missed one vital part of the infrastructure, which is entry level housing. I mean, that is virtually as a whole in this country. Um, um, what I wonder is <coughs> perhaps we could divert, say, 10 billion pounds from buying treasuries for quantitative easing to stimulate the entry level housing market. I think we'd get more than, um, say, 100,000 new houses a year. And I think this wouldn't be vastly inflationary and would be a tremendous benefit, A, to the construction industry, uh, probably to the, uh, the executive in terms of taking builders off benefits, would make the workforce more flexible and would stabilize house prices. I, I just can't see why we don't do something. Um, we've got a chronic shortage of entry level housing in this country. Great, we'd like to take that first, on those three first. And <coughs> the planning one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about the planning that we're using on, on the Thames Tunnel. Um, it goes very much to the, the point I think the gentleman from the, the Mayor's Office have talked about. Th this is a long linear project. It goes from Acton in the west of London to Beckton in the east. We go through 40 <coughs> boroughs. And if you were going under the, you know, the Town and Country Planning Act uh, and you were heading for a public inquiry, it's the sort of project that probably never happened. So we are uh, going under the uh, provision of what was, was called the Infrastructure Planning Commission. It's now I think the Major Infrastructure uh, Planning Unit of the Planning Inspectorate. It's not a hybrid bill. So you've really got three ways of doing planning for large projects in this country. <coughs> sort of middle way. The end-to-end -end process for us will probably turn out to be in about six years. Well, four years, there's a lot, of, a lot of work, serious work's been going on really poorly for four years to now. Just two more years to go. And you know, I sort of ask myself, is six years an unreasonable length of period for a project as large and complex as ours, cutting through 14 boroughs of London with 24 construction sites? I mean, I'm interested to see what the audience think. I don't think six years is an unreasonable period of time for something that's potentially so disruptive to London. Now, the alternative of having you know, endless public inquiries, which is totally unacceptable, but this, going this route, you don't have a public inquiry. What you have is very extensive consultation, which we've had to do twice, and some of you may have been involved in that, but we talk to all the affected communities. And if you do that properly, you don't then need a public inquiry. And I say, I, I actually think that's not how I mean, we criticise the planning system in this country, but I think we might have been slightly quicker with a hybrid bill. I think that would be a good challenge. In hindsight, would this project be better off with a hybrid bill? Probably. We might have shaved one or two years off it. But I personally don't think six years is an unreasonable period of time for project. Oh, perhaps you could take on the housing question. <laughs> well, on, on the housing, I, mean, I, I share your fundamental position, which is that there is a critical shortage, not just of entry level <coughs> housing, but of housing, of, of housing of the sort which people actually want to buy and can afford. However, I don't think that the, uh, the, the, the answer to that is to pump up demand, because the supply, given our system, is so inelastic most of that increased demand was simply going higher prices. What we've got to do is, I mean, and virtually all the research that's been done over the last 30 years comes to the same conclusion, that if you ration space, which is exactly what our planning system is doing, taking no account of the price of space, then you get a shortage of supply. You've got to fix, you know, between 1890 and 1955, the population increased by about 60%, living standards more or less doubled in real terms, the price of housing hardly increased at all, <coughs> the price of housing land didn't increase at all. I, I, should make clear, I, I was suggesting increasing supply, not demand, oh, no, building. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, no, 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 because yeah. you said to put it more... I'm sorry. Uh, and there, are lots of, there are some ways you could get building going, but you can't get building going unless you make the, the planning system release land by Making it in, I, mean, I agree with this, and making it in people's interests to release land. And there are various ways of doing that. One of them is something in the system that used to work, which was that local authorities were able to buy land at agricultural prices and then develop it. Uh, I think that's a jolly good idea. Uh, concentrate a few minds in local authorities. James, but well, can you just add one or two things? I mean, we are wrestling, Rob, with this mm. housing thing, as you know, at the moment, and there is vigorous debate. <laughs> around government about 
the supply side versus the demand side, or whether we should should do you know things on both and um, and, and, and how to do it. I mean, I you know some of the, we certainly have got a lot of um, government-owned land that is ripe for housing development, and. You know, to give an example of where we're trying to be joined up about it, there are two particular projects north of Cambridge where actually they need to be unlocked by road improvements. And um, again, these are sort of uh, these are small steps to get properly joined up on this. But Oliver Letwin and I kind of sit down with teams of officials and maps, and you know, ask you know rather sort of basic questions like, let's see the map of where. You know the new housing is needed and where there are road developments or where the new power stations are going to go and whether it maps up with the, the what you know the, the department for energy and climate change's map maps up with the uh, um, transport map and, and actually um, um, in cambridgeshire housing roads and unlocking it um, there are some big gains to be had but we are we are wrestling with um, uh, this question of increasing supply and that either has to do with freeing up and easing the um, planning for time short-term incentives to get kick-started um, more um, uh, you know arrangements with the, the developers but all all to be um, looked at um, I think the lessons from the Olympic um, experience very important um, I think on the actual contracted I know it's not not to your point, but actually, on the um, on the, we have learned an awful lot on public sector procurement and forms of contracting, which were, are now being embedded through Infrastructure UK into more of the public sector more widely. Um, you know, I would love to hear kind of what what we can take away from the um, the way that the um, Olympics was planned um, uh, to keep the momentum up in East London more generally, because. Some people come to me and say we need a sort of bazaar for East London. Others are fiercely protective of their individual patches. The GLA kind of sits conveniently in the middle of all of this, and um, I, I guess I would, you know, throw it back at you and say you've got to be telling us what what the the solution is. And as to HS2 and Heathrow, I, I mean, I hear hear what you say, and but as I said before, um, actually one of the next things that, as you, I'm sure you know, that that. Um, um, the Department for Transport and Justin Greening will be doing for the further refinement of, of the HS2 route will be to have further detail on this. I think it's due in the autumn. I think we've got time for two more questions, if there are any. A few. Um, we'll take the gentleman in the glasses and tie and then right up the front here. Thanks very much. Uh, Ralph Scott from Four Communications. Um, when we talk about infrastructure projects, there seems to be sort of a, a tends to be a focus on sort of the big prestige, sort of the 40 big ones, the 500 big ones. But actually, a lot of the big, the big, the important infrastructure projects, the slightly smaller ones, the sort of the grid infrastructure, the sort of regional roads, uh, local energy provision. And one of the things that we lost um, with the sort of the review of planning policy was sort of that regional level of planning, um, and. I, I'm just interested whether we feel that that's something really has been lost there, whether we think the government um, can actually drive forward the infrastructure projects that the country needs at that level, or whether there is something missing at that sort of larger than local level, um, and how we get local authorities who aren't perhaps always the best at cooperating across borders we've heard in East London, so it takes a sort of a, a, a very hard deadline like the Olympics to get them to to actually create the sort of incentives that are needed to, um, to make that kind of larger global cooperation happen. Okay, thanks. And then final one down at the front, you see. Good evening, Mark Richard Fieldby. Um, I'd like to congratulate um, our UK for their efforts at um, encouraging pension funds, institutional investors, at looking at um, infrastructure investment in the UK. I just wanted to just concentrate on one quick point, which is just that I wonder whether the issue is not about creating demand for infrastructure investment, it's about actually the supply of projects themselves. And it's not about financing, it's actually about government funding. And does there need to be almost a resetting of expectations about how much government are actually going to commission for infrastructure? Because 
I think the National Infrastructure Plan, especially the second one, was a great step forward in terms of giving everyone a vision of what infrastructure could look like. I think ultimately, um, we're under a lot of fiscal constraints, and I, I personally, I'm not trying to be too negative about it all, but I just think that, that the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the, the commissioning of large greenfield uh, projects are, uh, are, are gone, I think, these days. Huge numbers of them, and it's about capacity building and incremental, incremental building. I'm just wondering whether we need to reset expectations off the back of that. Why are we spending a lot of time talking to institutional investors unless it's it's not about greenfield, is it about brownfield? Super. I promised James to get away by quarter two, so I'm going to give each panelist from that direction to this direction a minute each to, to answer either of those questions that they, they fancy and also summarise the one thing we would do now to improve the system. <laughs> no challenge here. I'm, <laughs> I, tend to, I tend to actually introduce the, uh, the Twitter that we're all here, it's 140 characters, but I, I'll, I'll give you a minute or so. Um, very quickly, uh, going through with some of the points that are of interest, I think that uh, for the big projects, um, things like the Mayor's Development Corporation are, are the essential problem with guns that have been raised here in the uh, middle where there are projects that um, you, you can't de 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 define things um, uh, very well. Um, I worry for the nation that um, a single opportunity like Old Earth Common on, on the current basis of transport planning may well be lost in the economic terms. I wonder what we can do as a nation to, um, stop, to stop that. Uh, I think we've got to be much better at, at um, incrementalism, at networking, and, and layering what we've got, especially in the asset. Do you imagine that's perfect to <laughs> Incrementalism, good idea. Uh, the Eddington Report did a ranking of uh, the most highest rate of return projects. And some of them were quite small, uh, but there were, I think, 300 projects which had a rate of return beyond, up, well above the Treasury's cutoff level. The highest, I think, was 300% uh, rate of return. Uh, probably not getting built because it's in the public sector. This is the, I think, problem. And uh, here I'm sounding, uh, I'm going to sound too critical, but I'm not. I mean, I think bringing in private money into infrastructure is very positive. However, you have to recognize that there is some infrastructure which is easier to fund through private funding than other infrastructure because you have to be able to earn a return. You can fund an airport, but you can't fund a road system through, uh, you can't efficiently fund a road system or improvements to a road through system through private money. So there has to be a role for the public sector. And, I, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, important, though, it is to bring in private money. What can we do? We can make the, the public planning system responsive to land prices. That would solve the problem if only we could do it. But I recognize that it's difficult for politicians to do it. Yeah. Thank you. One of the themes that both questioners had there was what about small projects? We've heard a lot about big projects, what about the incremental and small? And uh, they are in a special category because what the frustration that everybody feels about large projects is it takes too long. There are two issues there. One is the planning process, the other is the procurement route because you have to go through a systematic procurement process. Certain classes of small projects don't suffer from that. There are certain organisations like local authorities, regulated utilities that have some reserve planning powers of their own, and a lot of these organisations also have framework agreements already in place. So if you want to turn the volume up quickly, I know this is something very likely that the IUK team will be looking at, if you want to turn the volume up quickly on getting infrastructure to stand out, but it's the smaller scale where you've got framework agreements and pre-existing planning powers, there's a big role there uh, that's for, for the economic regeneration. You won't be surprised if you say the big thing for me, intergenerational legacy has to be seen as a social good in its own right. Something about leaving the world a better place than we found it, or else we're never going to go for a long term strategy. James, final word. Um, I completely agree about this question about um, uh, the regional or the sort of sub national projects, and um, that's precisely why we have designed the local enterprise partnerships as they are, are to be around economically logical areas, whether they're conurbations um, or they're groupings of rural areas, and they have got to be the engine um, of demand, or one of the principal engines demanding um, regional, local infrastructure spend, and we have um, a fund alongside that into which um, 
they and other regional interests can be. So, so um, we have got new vehicles precisely to address that point. As to the question about whether we should be optimistic or not and how much there is to go, I mean, I was dealing with, with new power projects this afternoon. We haven't talked really hardly at all about power, but you know, in power alone, whether it's nuclear um, or it's um, wind or it's, it's new combined cycle gas turbines, there has to be many tens of billions of pounds going in. The water investment is going to continue to run at tens of billions of pounds. So it, there is a massive amount. I agree with you that there, that there are expectations to be managed, particularly on the social um, infrastructure side, where we've had to roll back on some of the expenditure, hospitals, schools. That, and, and so in certain areas, I agree with you um, that we need to be realistic in managing people's expectations. But I think I'm, I'm you know, very excited about the um, the way we will push this forward, notwithstanding all the difficulties we've um, identified this evening. Not least, incidentally, I mean, I can't let Paul get away with the idea. In case anyone's going to go burn down the burn down the city of London, <laughs> <laughs> but the you know this is this, this exemplifies the best and the worst of the British on this over 300 years or more, which is that of course the whole of London was burned down, but the city was burned down. Christopher Wren and others came up with a beautiful grid plan, and then the property owners all reasserted their historic rights right. to their property. So we, it was burnt down, and we still have the medieval street plan for the entire city of London. So burn, even burning it down, I'm afraid, in this country, doesn't work. Do you get rid of the green belt? <laughs> yeah, get rid of the green belt. On that positive note, I, I should um, probably say that there's far too much heat for me to really sum up. So um, two things, we, we, we do have the, um, there will be a video on, on YouTube if anyone wants to catch up any of the points. That also means that um, you'll be on air saying that we should burn that as the blood and say <laughs> don't do it because it's, it's down in evidence. Um, on that point, I just want to thank the panelists very much for their time and thank everyone for coming. Thank you very much.